Good afternoon. I'm Jay Schnitzer, and I'm going to talk about something really completely different. So uh, my talk has absolutely nothing to do with prostate cancer, and I know absolutely or nearly nothing about prostate cancer beyond which I learned in medical school, and that was so many decades ago that I don't even want to count, and, and a millennium ago. But I was asked uh, by Jonathan to come in and talk to you about some things that might encourage you to think beyond your usual swim lane in terms of the kind of work you do. So I want to give you some examples of how we think at DARPA creatively and differently. And by the way, uh, pay uh, no attention to uh, what's going on behind the curtain here. We're going we're gonna to actually uh, take some risk while we're up here. Uh, this is my assistant, Emily, who's going to set up a demonstration that we're going to run in a little bit. So. She'll be working on that while I'm talking. Um, and it, we'll, we'll see whether, in fact, it really works. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk to you quickly about uh, DARPA, because some of you may not know DARPA. Some of you may have heard about it, but not really know what it is or who it is or what it does. Uh, that mystique is not accidental. DARPA does a pretty good job about keeping everybody a little bit confused, perhaps. But uh, DARPA was formed uh, f 54 years ago uh, in response to something which some of you in the audience will remember, and many of you probably are too young to remember, and that was something called Sputnik. And for those of you who are too young to remember that event back in 1958, uh, the Russians put a satellite in orbit before we did. Uh, I can tell you, and I am old enough actually to have some memory of that, I can tell you it was a shock. It was a shock to the country. Uh, people were really, really upset about it. In particular, Congress was really, really upset about it. Congress responded in the way that Congress does when it gets really upset about it. It's something. It uh, created an act. The act of Congress created the precursor of DARPA called ARPA. And the express mission of this agency in the federal government then and 54 years later was very simple. It was to prevent strategic surprise elsewhere and to achieve strategic surprise here. And the office that I have, uh, which is the Defense Sciences Office within DARPA, is actually the scientific branch of DARPA. And our mission is very simply stated, all you have to do is add the word science in each of those clauses. So my role and my team's role is to prevent scientific strategic surprise elsewhere and achieve scientific strategic surprise here. So we are very much focused on mission, on capabilities. We have so-called performers, think of them as principal investigators from a wide variety of fields. My office is science writ, writ large, so it's not just medicine, although we do medicine and biomedical research and biology, but it's all of science, which uh, uh, obviously is an infinitely large and complex space. And we're all about doing things that are going to literally uh, uh, change, change how we do uh, science in the future. Our organizational chart of the agency is very simple. It's, even though it has a high impact, it's a small agency. There are only about 100 uh, uh, scientists in the entire agency, broken up into six offices, which is DARPA speak for uh, divisions or departments. As I said, uh, mine's the Defense Science Office down in the lower left-hand corner. There are five other offices, and our director is Dr. Arthi Prabhakar. But we don't own anything, and we don't actually have any facilities. So we don't have labs. We don't have an intramural program. We basically have program managers who manage programs that are conducted by investigators in laboratories elsewhere, in universities, in industry, private sector, public sector, et cetera, et cetera. This is my team. I'm very, very, very proud of it. We've, I've got roughly 20 program managers, and you're going to hear about some of their work in a minute working within my team. And again, as I said, we are responsible for covering all of, all of science, which is a very, very big area. For those of you who might want to think about someday applying for or successfully uh, obtaining DARPA funding, and by the way, we do fund medical projects, we are interested in things that are really going to change the world. The, your project has to be revolutionary, not evolutionary. It's got to be something that's in line with where our interests are in terms of our program managers, but they're very diverse, as I mentioned. 
I care more about the project, I'm sorry to say, than I do about you as individual investigators. Sorry, that's the reality, get over it. We're gonna be very focused on getting things done, not about making necessarily careers in the process and certainly not about making mine and, uh, and will be milestone driven. I was asked early on in my uh, tenure at DARPA, and I've been at DARPA just over a year now, to, to, to create a vision statement. This is the vision, and it's a deliberately intended to be painful to you. I already told you that we cover all of science, so that's a vast, infinite space in all dimensions and complex. Against that space, I've got finite resources, so my vision is I've got a really hard problem. But we do have an approach to it. But we do want to change the world in the process, really change the world. We really want to make a difference. And what we really want to do is to, for somebody to look back 20 years from now, so somebody sitting at 2032 looking back on what, what happened at DARPA during the last 20 years, I want them to be able to look back and say, yes, these last 20 years DARPA did really important things that really changed the world and made a difference. Um, we do have a methodology to achieve this. I'm not going to go through this in great, great detail, except to say that we use certain lenses to let us focus in on the specific areas that we want to, want to work on. Obviously, it has to have some application to national security. We, the D in DARPA is, after all, defense. But beyond that, we really want to do things that, that matter, things that are risky, things that nobody else will do. If it's a project or an idea that the NIH might fund or might be interested in, by definition, we are not. So we're not trying to compete for similar turf. We really want to carve out things in areas that nobody else will tackle because it's too hard, too out there, too crazy, too expensive, takes too long. And when an expert in the field who is asked to evaluate an idea that we have says, oh, you can't do that, that's impossible, that's when I'm really interested. So I just want to tell you about a, a few programs that we have either recently or ongoing to suggest to you some of the different things that we do and how we do it. And again, this will have absolutely nothing to do with prostate cancer. However, it's all going to be on the final exam tonight, so please pay attention. Uh, you will be tested on this and you will be held accountable. This program, MCMA, is Materials with Controlled Microstructural Architectures, is a program led by Dr. Judah Goldwasser, who is one of the names on the list I showed earlier. And what you see in the picture here is one of these uh, complex structures that's being held up by a dandelion. So this structure is strong enough for me to be able to stand on it and to support my weight, yet it's light enough weight-wise, to be able to sit on top of a dandelion, and it really is light. I mean, these things are amazingly light. And they're designed and built by novel architecture. So here it is now in real time, same structure, sitting on some soap bubbles, just to emphasize the point that this is really, really light, yet it'll support my body weight. And how's this done? It's done by carefully engineering a special lattice that'll, uh, that'll withstand that, that has special properties shown in this slide. And so watch how it deforms. It's got memory, it crinkles, it looks like all the strands are breaking. This is a nickel alloy. It looks like it's completely destroyed when it's completely buckled. And then watch what happens when it's released. The material completely restores itself to its original position. Really remarkable structure and remarkable behavior in a material that we haven't seen before. So think about the potential applications of materials like this and structures like this that are completely different than we've had before and are amazingly lightweight. So that's an example of something that we're doing. If we switch gears completely now and talk about flight uh, and aeronautics, I'm very, and we are very interested in biomimicry. If you think about traditional man-made machines that fly, they're based on two principles, either fixed wing or rotary wing, i.e. airplanes or helicopters. But think about nature. Nature has some, uh, some 
uh, organisms that uh, do flight amazingly well, uh, much better than we do. They include insects, they include birds. In particular, they include the hummingbird. A hummingbird is an amazing flying uh, machine. It can fly forwards, it can fly left, it can fly right, it can fly up, it can fly down, it can hover in place, it can fly backwards, and it can flip and fly upside down. So we asked, could we invent a device that flies like a hummingbird and is about the same size and weight and has the same properties? And here you're seeing an early demonstration of just such a device that does, in fact, have all those degrees of freedom of flight, just like I described, and can be completely controlled. And it's as small as, as it looks in the film. It's, it's this big and this light. So again, the lesson here isn't what do we do with this, it's what do we do with biomimicry. And biology has, offers us tremendous insights for possibilities that we tend not to think of when we're talking about man-made things. We can talk more about that in the question and answers, but here's an example of doing something differently than we've conventionally thought of. This was started uh, a few years ago. Obviously, it's had the success that I described, and, uh, um, and I won't give you any more of the program details than that. It was uh, on the cover of Time Magazine's in 50 Inventions of the Year last December uh, as the, uh, as the uh, cover girl, and uh, uh, we're quite proud of this. If, if you want to know what the applications might be, think in terms of this will carry a payload, it will carry a small camera with a... Uh, with a transmitter and, and transmit images in real time, uh, t telemetry in real time, which can be used to probe areas that are too dangerous for humans to go into. So for example, obviously the military implications are should be pretty clear to you. But beyond that, it can also be used in disaster scenarios or dangerous environments. Think of a nuclear reactor meltdown where you've got to send something in to find out what's going on, and obviously you don't want to risk people. This can get anywhere you need it to go and send you back the images. On the biological side, and now we're going to head over towards the demo and try to show you uh, what we're talking about in a minute. For battlefield medicine, one of the really important unsolved medical problems to date is uh, death from non-compressible hemorrhage. When I say non-compressible hemorrhage, think of major liver injury resulting in huge amount of blood loss from the liver from multiple lacerations from either blunt or penetrating trauma. This is still to this day a major problem for the military. It's also a big problem in civilian life, particularly in places that are more remote where the time of transport to a tertiary facility is beyond uh, the golden window of an hour. So this program was designed to, to deal with that problem, and, what, what the, and this was led by uh, Dr. Brian Holloway in our group, and what uh, the investigators and the performers have come up with is a foam that can be injected by a small incision through the umbilicus into the abdomen, which <clears throat> through some kind of device to be determined, here's just a, a mock-up that's not the real clinical device, and this is still a program in the works, this is not done, which when injected in will actually expand and staunch the flow of blood. And in fact, in, uh, in animal studies, it is remarkably effective. So hopefully this is ready. We'll see whether this demo works. Uh, it, taking a huge risk by actually doing a demo live in front of you rather than uh, just showing you the video. But we have the foam loaded up here, and there's just a couple of MLs loaded of the two agents in this cartridge. And I don't know if you can see from way back there. I'll hold it up. But I'm just going to inject, inject it into the bottom as a mixed liquid, which is just a few MLs total. And then if we are successful in real time, uh, we can show something happen here. And if we're not, it'll be another DARPA failure. <laughs> the good news is uh, I'm evaluated in terms of having enough, since we are in the high risk business, my job is to have enough failures. Otherwise, I'm not taking enough risk. But I don't know if you can see that. Maybe if I hold it up, you'll see it. So it started with a little bit of liquid in the bottom, and now it's creating a foam. And the way it works 
is by volume expansion in the peritoneal cavity. So this is exactly, imagine this happening in real time in the peritoneal cavity, and it'll, hopefully it'll continue to grow a little bit more so you can see that. It grows to 40x, 40 times its initial volume, and then conforms to all the surfaces within the abdominal cavity, including under the liver and around the bleeding vessels, and applies pressure to everything, fills it up, and stops the blood loss completely and turns a lethal model, nearly 100% lethality, into a 90% survival situation. There's nothing else in the world that does that. So we're very excited about this as uh, the, one of the next things in control of, uh, uh, of hemorrhage. So this is a robotics program, one of many we have, and this Switching gears again in completely, this is a four-legged robot. And the four-legged robot, uh, designed as you can see by Boston Dynamics, is modeled after the cheetah in terms of how it functions. Previously, the land speed record for a four-legged robot was about eight or 10 miles an hour. This, this version of the cheetah and upgrades to it over the last six months has taken that land speed record just over the last uh, six months and gone from eight to 10 to 12 to 15 to 20. And just last week, it, it eclipsed 30 miles an hour. So this is a new land speed record for a four-legged four robot. And we're still climbing. Uh, we, we shall see whether it, it, it's able to go even faster. But this is a, a really exciting development and a work in progress that continues to amaze us as well. The next thing I want to le uh, talk to you about is something that some of you have, may have heard about uh, before and will also be covered by my uh, uh, program manager who uh, does this work, Dr. Jeff Ling, tomorrow at his talk at the NIH. But Jeff has led an amazing truly amazing uh, upper extremity prosthetics program that I just want to share a little bit of where we are today. There are two components to this program. One is a um, uh, mechanically controlled arm, a so-called DECA arm. DECA is uh, uh, the company that uh, works on it. It's Dean Kamen's company up in New Hampshire. These are some examples of what it can do. And just, just to prove that um, we're not just talking about PowerPoint here, this is actually the this is the DECA arm, and it is functional. Fully, this one is fully functional. This is not a mock-up. This is not a prototype. This is the real deal. This can go on a patient. This is currently in testing for FDA safety, but this is the Generation 3 DECA arm. It's been used <coughs> clinically already in clinical trials uh, uh, conducted by our colleagues at the VA, who have been uh, phenomenal partners in getting this work done. And I just want to show you uh, a little bit uh, about what this can do. So here's a, a patient who's uh, missing his left arm who has the DECA arm. Now the mechanical control for this is through linkages going down to his feet. And so he's moving his feet up and down and flexing his toes in order to operate this. And now he's able to feed himself uh, with this arm using uh, um, chopsticks, and he's pretty happy about it. The other uh, branch of the program uh, is a completely different arm. It's a little further, uh, further for upstream in development. This is, an arm, this is a work that's going on in conjunction between Johns Hopkins and um, University of Pittsburgh, as well as uh, uh, colleagues on the West Coast. Their experiments are to uh, try to use direct output from the cortex, from the human brain, electrically to the arm to control the arm motion just by thinking. This has been done previously in non-human primates very successfully, and I spoke about that uh, uh, previously at a, a Milken uh, conference several months ago, but I wanted to share with you the results of the uh, first human use of this. Uh, and so this is a gentleman who uh, is paralyzed uh, from the neck down from a diving accident, has not been able to use his arms for years, a young man. He's controlling this arm, which you see is not connected to him. And all he's doing is thinking. So thought alone is controlling this arm. 
That's his girlfriend. This is the first time he ever tried it, by the way. Think about what you just saw. He's got an arm that he's never used before that's standing on a stand six feet away from him, not even connected to him, that's completely mechanical. And both she and he think that they're holding hands for the first time in over seven years. It, it's, uh, it, it's an amazing thing. I'll give you one last, uh, last comment about this, uh, this last study with Jeff, and uh, again, he'll talk more about it tomorrow in, in his talk at the NIH. Um, I mentioned the monkey experiments, and I'll leave you with this parting thought to try to get you to start thinking about what else is possible in the world of science. When, he was doing the mo when they were doing the non-human primate studies, obviously they were not amputated in monkeys. They were wired up and connected to an arm, but they still had four extremities. In order to get the monkey to use the arm rather than his, his native arm, they had to restrain uh, the right arm, native arm of a monkey, and teach the monkey to, by thought, use, use the, uh, the remote arm. By the way, the algorithms that were generated for, from that, those monkey experiments, were actually the ones that were used for the humans exactly the same algorithm without modification, and the, it's, and, the, and the picture you just saw, the video you just saw, was the first time that was used with an unmodified monkey algorithm. So whenever you start thinking we're a whole lot different from other species, think again. Um, but anyway, uh, so the monkey, when it was being trained, had the right arm during the training sessions restrained for the training period, which is two, three months. At the conclusion of all that, uh, the investigators decided, once the monkey was using the, uh, the, the uh, um, experimental arm uh, freely and smoothly, to release the restrained arm. And then an unexpected thing happened. It was expected that the monkey would revert to using his native arms and ignore the other one. Monkey decided to use five extremities instead of four. And could seamlessly and in coordinated fashion use his left arm, his right arm, and his other right arm. Now, those of you who remember a little neuroanatomy from, uh, from medical school will remember that, you know, we're taught classically that there are two motor strips and there's a homunculus on either side. And the last time I checked, each of those homunculus had one left and one right. And so where's this third arm? So I would challenge you to think beyond what we're taught the human brain is much more plastic than we ever imagined. The adult brain, as a monkey brain is, the human has got to be just as plastic, and, and also the human adult brain is much more plastic than we ever thought. I would argue that it is going to be possible in the future for the human brain to control N limbs, where N may be a whole lot bigger than four. And I'll get, leave you with a final thought that some of those limbs don't have to be in the same zip code. So, um, and since you like that idea, I'll leave you with one last idea. So if you really want to really get a little crazy, and that's what we like to do at DARPA, if you really want to get a little crazy, think about going the other way. So we've been talking motor, how about sensory? Well, now you could well imagine that if the motor cortex is that plastic, probably so is the sensory cortex, or at least sensory input sections of the brain. So is it possible for us to teach our brain, if we have sensors that sense different things, think infrared, think ultraviolet, think ultrasound, think anything you want, magnetism, that come into our brain, that our brain could learn to interpret those signals? and is plastic enough? And could we invent new devices that would let us do things that we can't do with our native senses? And could we do the same with patients who are impaired by not having their native senses, i.e. the blind? So I'll leave you with that parting thought. At DARPA, we're always looking for smart people with great ideas, if you have them. Or, and so we're looking for talent and ideas, if you have either or know if people have either. 
I, I warned Mike I'd be shameless about uh, asking for uh, people to come forward and identify themselves as being interested. Always happy to talk to you or email us at any time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? When the surgeons have taken out that material, yes. uh, has there been any residual uh, impact on it? No, great question. I wish I had uh, thought to plant that question because it's perfect. Uh, so the, the surgical removal of foam is, for a surgeon is very easy. Comes out in one block. Not only that, it's possible as you're, and I've seen this and uh, participated in it, so I'm speaking from personal experience, it's possible to elevate the block so that you can actually dissect down with great care to the site of the bleeding, controlling the bleeding simultaneously, get control of it, and then remove it all and finish the control. So it's a remarkable aid in the, in the definitive operation. Doesn't, meta doesn't embolize, doesn't break up, comes out in one piece and, is very, and doesn't stick. Uh, so it's uh, remarkably well behaved in that regard. Could you code it? So that was actually the, uh, so the question is, can you, could you code it particularly with bioactive moieties that might uh, 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 accelerate thrombosis? That was actually the original design of the program. We had the surprising and unexpected discovery that the foam alone did the job amazingly well. So we decided for this point in time, good enough is good enough, and the need is so acute that we really want to get this to the field where it can save lives. And by the way, at this point, it's a device because it's not coded rather than uh, a drug or a composite. So the regulatory pathway is different and perhaps shorter and faster. So we decided not to coat the generation one, but for future generations, yes, indeed. And that's work in progress. Do most of your ideas come from just crazy scientists thinking of something applied to you, or do you actually do you come up with strategic needs from perhaps a defense angle and ask crazy scientists to work on them? So the question is, how do, how, how do we get our ideas, and where does all this um, craziness come from? And the answer is all the above. Uh, so uh, my job as the office director is to find new talent to recruit to DARPA with crazy ideas. So I'm, that's why I'm being shameless about uh, my request. It's real. People come to us with ideas. We read the literature and pay attention to what's going on out there, too. We also do our own brainstorming sessions with our own teams. We have advisory councils who help us come up with new ideas as well uh, and, uh, and think about crazy new ideas. And, then, and, and, and we, we, get, we get people sending, sending us stuff all the time. Uh, we, there's no shortage of great ideas. By the way, some of the craziest ideas and some of the most interesting ideas come from unorthodox uh, sources. So we've had some of our best ideas come from science fiction writers. But then again, if you think back to, and those of you who are old enough to know what I'm talking about, you think back to the early days of Star Trek, we used to think this little flip phone was an amazing thing. And uh, <laughs> look, look what happened. Jay, if... Um if you got a phone call that bioterrorism was killing uh, 510,000 Americans a year, and you were called to Congress to talk about how DARPA would take on the problem, and the problem was uh, genomic alterations in cancer, because the numbers are about right, and you were asked, um, the foam's amazing, um, American people have probably never been more secure because of an extraordinary amount of classified activity after 9-11. But you were asked to fix the NCI. At least talk about the DARPA culture in terms of uh, taking greater risk, um, but then having the security of the American people is the great return, security from cancer. What would be the four things you'd tell Congress if you were to DARPAfy uh, Harold Varmus' uh, inner sanctum? Uh, is Harold in the room? <laughs> is this being recorded? I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, so, so, so let me let me be careful about your fixing NCI. Let's 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 not assume that NCI is broken. How about the whole NCI? No, no, it's fine. I, I, so, so uh, uh, Francis and I have had this conversation, so I can speak frankly. So. First of all, I don't think the NIH or any part of it is broken, but I think there are different approaches to, to, to problems. So, um, and, 
and they all have validity. My suggestion would be that we tackle hard problems in multiple ways rather than just one way. So the, the DARPA recipe and the DARPA approach is great for some things, but not for everything. And um, it's kind of top down and very much we take a, top, a topic that we want to go after and then we manage our approach to it very carefully. The NIH approach is investigator driven and kind of bottom up a little bit more. Uh, yes, there are some RFAs about specific things, but generally speaking, if you get an R01, you get to go do your thing for five years and come back and show them how many publications you get so that you can get your grant renewed. At DARPA, if you get a grant from us, I want to see what you got for results at six months and 12 months, and if you're not on track, you lose your money and I give it to somebody else. And by the way, the results that you get have to be answering the questions we wanted to answer, we wanted to answer it at the beginning, not questions you changed and decided would be more interesting for you to do. So it requires a different mindset, requires a different approach. Not all investigators like it. It doesn't work for all problems, so it's not you know, one size fits all. But I would suggest to uh, my colleagues at the NIH that they seriously consider segmenting off some part of their portfolio for a DARPA-like approach. That's already happened. That's happened at NCATS. So, uh, uh, and Francis Collins has supported that and actually championed it, so it's happening. We actually have a new program that it was just started uh, last fall in, um, Microphysiological systems led by Dr. Barry Pallotta at DARPA. Basically, it's a human on a chip. The idea is let's work on the problem of identifying accurately potential drug toxicity in preclinical trials for new substances that might have therapeutic benefit, not using rodents. Rodents, which are the so called gold standard, are honestly no better than. A flip of a coin, 50-50 either way, both in terms of false positives and false negatives for toxicity. Yet it takes time and money and it's still not very good. So can we do the same thing with human tissues on a chip? That's Barry's program. The NIH said, well, we really want to understand not just normal tissues but disease tissues. So can we have a program in parallel that will be uh, partnered together? And the answer was yes. That was announced and started and, and so the NIH part of it and the DARPA man part of it are going to be managed in parallel with lots of connections and the NIH management is going to be very similar in the way it's done to DARPA and not at all like what a traditional NIH program would be. So we're getting some traction there, but I'd love to do the next thing. So I'd love to say to the NIH, what's next and what do you want to work on next and can we do something together and can we learn from one another and if that opportunity were to present itself, I'd go after it in a heartbeat. I just wanted to do something simpler and say thank you for showing me a future where I'll be able to give a prostate exam to Dr. Sewell and Simul Simon <laughs> simultaneously and virtually while I'm in Michigan and they're in California. I'm, ju I'm just here to make you happy. <laughs> thank you for that, Ken. Thank you.